Alrighty, folks, I think we'll get going. So uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Cooking with Gas, Health Harms from Gas Stoves. My name is Zach Williams, and I am the health educator and campaign coordinator for the Environment and Health Program with Physicians for Social Responsibility at the National Office. I'd like to thank you all again for joining today's presentation and for your attention over the next 45 to 60 minutes. First, just some quick logistics. Um, as I begin and continue with the presentation, uh, please drop any and all questions into the uh, chat box down at the uh, bottom of your screen. And there will be a portion at the end of the presentation where we will go over um, all of these questions and feel free to just shoot them into the chat box uh, as they uh, come up. Uh, next, if anyone has any other questions that we don't get to uh, get to, my email is on the screen and I am about to drop it into the chat box as well. Please feel free to email uh, me any comments, questions, concerns uh, while we, uh, if we don't get to your, if don't, don't get to your question. In that case, uh, let me jump right into the presentation. And just a little bit of background, if you do not know already who Physicians for Social Responsibility is, uh, we are a national nonprofit founded by physicians with 33,000 members. We mobilize physicians and health professionals to advocate for climate solutions and a nuclear weapons free world and contribute the desperately needed health voice to energy, environmental health and nuclear weapons policy at the local, federal and international level. Um, if all of you are members of Oregon PSR, I'm sure all of you know who Physicians for Social Responsibility is already. Um, just a couple, uh, just an outline of how today's presentation is going to go. Here are the learning objectives and how I've organized this training for tonight. By the end of this session, participants will be able to articulate how cooking with gas appliances produces dangerous indoor air pollution and explain the health effects of each pollutant. They will be able to recognize and prioritize vulnerable populations as well as understand why they are vulnerable. And finally, address the health effects of gas stove pollution and explain to patients, friends, family, and loved ones the steps they can take to reduce their risk. Tonight's presentation is also CME and CEU accredited for both physicians and nurses. Uh, at the end of this presentation, there will be some instructions and a guide I will send out to claim this credit, uh, so no need to worry about this right now. This is a paragraph telling you that I promise that I'm not trying to sell you anything. Uh, I'm only here to educate and teach you all. And uh, next, before we jump right into the content, I do have an ask for you uh, real quick. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you can either scan the QR code on your screen, or I just dropped a link into the chat. I would ask if you could please complete this very short pre-test. It's five or six multiple choice questions, uh, just to so we can gauge what the level of knowledge was before and after this training. There will be a post-test at the end of the training as well. Um, so if we could take mm, probably the next two to three minutes, um, to complete this training, that will be great. Again, the link is right in the chat box uh, if for those of you who would like to complete it. And if you have a smartphone, you could also scan the QR code with the camera app um, to uh, directly access the survey as well. Uh, for our folks who just joined, thank you so much for joining. Uh, there is a link in the chat box, which I will drop again for the folks who just joined. Um, this is a short pre-test uh, just to see uh, levels of knowledge before and after the training. Uh, if we could take the next mm, two to three minutes to complete this very short pre-test, that would be great. Thank you all so much. All righty, folks, uh, we've hit the two minute mark and just in the interest of time to make sure we get through all the content and to leave enough time for the Q&A portion, I'm going to uh, continue on the presentation. If you didn't get to finish that pretest, don't you worry, it is not the end of the world by any means. Uh, so let's get going. So uh, before we jump into some actual learning and content, I have a question uh, for the group. So some audience participation would be great tonight. Uh, first question would be, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of gas stoves? You could either throw your response in the chat, unmute yourself and, and tell the group, um, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a gas stove? Fast heating, convenient. Fast heating, great, thank you. Quick heat.
adjustable Net. temperatures. Adjustable temperatures, great, thank you. Now we're cooking with gas, thank you. You can see where I got the title of this presentation. That's, that's what I tend to think of, that you know, positive colloquialism we have in the States. You know, your car won't turn over and then it finally does and now you're cooking with gas, you know? <laughs> All righty. We're on fire, fire risk. Fire risk, absolutely. Uh, now I think of methane. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> We haven't even started the presentation and you're already thinking about methane, which is a very good sign. Thank you so much. All righty, folks. So thank you so much for your participation. Uh, again, we have some negative and some positive connotations when we're thinking of uh, gas stoves. Um, but the fact remains that when we use uh, a gas stove without ventilation, dangerous indoor air pollutants are produced and are pumped into our kitchen, which leads to the first section of this training, which is understanding the pollutants produced by gas stoves and the health effects they have on the human body. The primary pollutants produced by gas stoves include nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter, both PM 2.5 and PM 0 0.1. PM 0 0.1 is also known as ultra fine particulate matter, if you've ever heard that phrase before. So these are the three primary pollutants, but what do they do to the human body? So let's zoom in a little bit here and take a look at what each of these air pollutants effects on the human body are. So let's start with nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide is a harmful air pollutant that is produced by the combustion of fossil fuels, including the methane we burn in our stoves. NO2 contributes to the development of asthma, aggravated asthma, and increased susceptibility to respiratory infections. It is also associated with negative general cognitive functioning overall. Next, carbon monoxide is another dangerous gas and perhaps more well known than nitrogen dioxide. Exposure to carbon monoxide can have neurological effects such as fatigue, impaired vision, dizziness, all the way to falling into a coma. For cardiac patients, Carbon monoxide can also lead to chest pain, and at high enough levels uh, or long enough exposures, carbon monoxide can also lead to death. Lastly, uh, let's talk about particulate matter, both PM 2.5 and PM 0 0.1. For context, PM 2.5 stands for uh, anything smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter, or any particle that is smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. These particles settle on the alveoli walls in our lungs, where they then set off a cascade of inflammatory changes that lead to that can lead to heart and lung disease. Ultrafine particles, PM 0.1, are any particles that are smaller than 100 nanometers. Now, these particles are small enough where they actually translocate into our bloodstream through either our lungs or our sinus vasculature and then distribute widely throughout the body. They can even cross the blood-brain barrier and they can accumulate in brain tissue. Now, both PM 2.5 and PM 0 0.1 can aggravate asthma, decrease lung function, and increase respiratory symptoms. They could also contribute to non-fatal heart attacks, irregular heartbeat, and premature death in people with heart and lung disease. Particulate matter has an asterisk next to it here in this chart because the amount of particulate matter that you will be able to measure coming off of a gas stove is really dependent on what is being cooked on the stovetop. In particularly, flat fats and oils, the olive oil, the butter, the avocado oil, the things that we use to pan fry things tend to produce a lot of particulate matter compared to just boiling water. However, you can measure particulate matter when you simply turn that burner on as well. Now, don't you worry about writing all of this down and memorizing this. At the end of this presentation, everyone will also receive these slides uh, with all of the information. So don't you worry, you don't need to memorize or uh, jot all of this down real quick. So these are all the awful things that happen to the human body from these air pollutants, but how much are we actually being exposed to them? So let's look at some exposure data real quick. On the left over here, you will see the national standards and guidelines relating to specifically NO2 concentrations. The United States does not have standards for indoor air pollution, so we use the outdoor standards as a reference. The US EPA national standard is 100 parts per billion, 
and the World Health Organization's indoor standard is 106 parts per billion. For context, one part per billion is like adding a single drop into an Olympic sized swimming pool. So it's an incredibly small unit of measure. So 100 may be a, a, a big number, but 100 parts per billion is actually kind of a small concentration that the EPA is saying you should not be around this for longer than an hour. Now, in terms of what we're exposed to from gas stoves, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory did a study on this and found some interesting points. The study showed that in houses that were less than 1,500 square feet, indoor air levels of NOx exceeded these standards more than 83% of the time when people were cooking on a gas stove without ventilation. And when folks were in a space that was less than 1,000 square feet, that number went up to 100% of the time exceeding these standards when they are cooking on a gas stove without ventilation. Now that's a lot of words and a lot of numbers. So let's look at this graphically to actually see what these folks measured in this study. So here's a graph I pulled from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory study and let's analyze this a little bit. So over here on the Y axis, you see that it's NO2 concentration in parts per billion but pay, pay special attention, it is a logarithmic scale. So here's 10, here's 100, here's 1,000. So it's not going up in even, even equal units. This 100 parts per billion, this line right here is what the EPA says, you should not be around anything higher than this for longer than an hour, it's unsafe. On the x-axis over here, we have time. Uh, this is the time of day that the researchers were measuring. And this red line over here is the concentration of NO2 in the kitchen. And this blue line is the concentration of NO2 in a hallway or a bedroom farther away from the kitchen. This house three is kind of the perfect storm of um, poor exposure to gas stove pollution. There was about eight houses that they were looking at at this study. House three is less than a thousand square feet is an older home and uh, has inadequate ventilation over the stove and around the house in general. So as you can see with each cooking function from this gas stove, whether it was using the oven or it was using the gas range, these researchers measured that the level of NO2 being pumped into the kitchen is much higher than what the EPA says is safe for each cooking function throughout the day. So this is showing that when we turn on and when we cook with, the, with this gas stove, we are being exposed to dangerous levels of air pollution, specifically in this graph, dangerous levels of NO2. So what does this dangerous level of NO2 do to the human body? So let's look at uh, another case study through the lens of asthma to see what a dangerous level of NO2 could do to the human body. So this is a study entitled Association of Changes in Air Quality with Incident Asthma in Children in California, 1993 to 2014. Long title, won't go into the nitty gritty of the research methods, but essentially all you need to know is that it's a multi-level longitudinal cohort study over 21 years, which is some of the best research designed to look at effects over time. And it wasn't just a couple years, it was over two decades. So what this study was looking at was in each of these communities in Southern California, each of these different colors is a different community, particularly around the Los Angeles region. Over here, let's look at nitrogen dioxide. On the Y axis, we have asthma incidence rate. So about how much childhood asthma the Southern California area is seeing. And over here on the X axis, we have nitrogen dioxide concentration, again, in parts per billion, but pay attention, it's inversed. So over here, we have high NO2 concentration, and over here, we have low NO2 concentration. So as we can see, as Los Angeles got its act together and started cleaning up the smog and cleaning up the air pollution, they saw less cases of childhood asthma as there was less NO2 and less ozone around the city and around the ambient area of Los Angeles. So essentially what this is demonstrating is that when you lower the amount of CO, uh, the, the amount of NO2, you also decrease, you see a decrease in the amount of incident childhood asthma cases that, uh, that you see. And childhood asthma 
is one of the most uh, prominent health effects from gas stove pollution. Now, I'm going to transition into the next part of our training here, looking at vulnerable populations. And the focus on childhood asthma and children is important here because children happen to be uh, some of the most vulnerable to gas stove pollution and its health effects. And that's for a couple of reasons. First, children have higher breathing rates than adults do. So they're uh, being exposed and breathing in more pollutants than an adult would. Next, children have higher lung surface to body weight ratios and smaller bodies. So an NO2 concentration that could be safe for an adult could actually be harmful for a child. And lastly, children's immature respiratory and immune systems are still undergoing development and don't necessarily have the ability to deal with stressors in the same way that adults can. So our little ones are particularly susceptible to these air pollutants that are being pumped out, pardon me, from gas stoves and will probably deal with these health effects uh, more. They're one of the most vulnerable populations for these health effects. Now, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into our vulnerable populations here and bring in some environmental justice and health disparity data as well. So let's continue to focus on children and childhood asthma but as a component of environmental justice. Not every child is equally exposed to gas stove pollutants and thus the distribution of childhood asthma is skewed. The data that I'm about to show you come from the National Center for Environmental Health and from the Journal of Urban Health. I'm not gonna go into every prevalence point that you're going to see on the slide right now, but I do think it's important that we look at these numbers and understand what they mean. So first let's look at housing. In terms of housing type, 21.8% of children living in public housing have asthma compared to just 7.38% of children living in private residences. Next, let's take a look at race and ethnicity. The prevalence of asthma in Puerto Rican children is almost twice that of white children, and the prevalence of asthma in black children is more than twice that than white children. And lastly, let's look at income level and socioeconomic status. 11.8% of children living below the poverty line deal with asthma, compared to just 5.9% of children living at 450% or higher of the federal poverty level. So living in a non-private dwelling, being black, and living below the federal poverty level are all risk factors for developing and exacerbating childhood asthma, one of the most prominent health effects from gas stove pollution. And why is this? And to fully understand these health disparities and why being a person of color and of low socioeconomic status in the United States we puts you at higher risk for respiratory illness, we have to look back at our history. So these are a couple examples. Uh, they are not the full explanation for environmental racism and health disparities in the United States, but I hope they just give a little bit of context to the background of why this is happening. So first, as an example, federal housing and transportation policies essentially codified racism into the economic and geographic development of the United States in the mid 20th century. First, as an example, the Federal Housing Act of 1949 authorized the demolition of black neighborhoods. And next, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 authorized the demolition of urban neighborhoods labeled as urban slums and replace them with the nascent interstate highway system. Uh, these urban slums, the, any neighborhood that was designated as an urban slum was often either poor, black, or both. This not only severed communities, most often black and brown neighborhoods, but also constructed long-term polluting transportation infrastructure next to, near, or simply through communities of color. Secondly, although it's outlawed today, many majority black neighborhoods are still reeling from the effects of redlining. Redlining is a homeowner's loan corporation categorization strategy where some neighborhoods were labeled as high risk whose residents should not be given access to mortgages. And these neighborhoods were outlined in red on their maps, hence the name redlining. However, now redlining refers to lending discrimination that bases credit decisions on the location of a property to the exclusion of characteristics of the borrower or the property. 
So who the borrower is, where the property is, and what type of neighborhood that is. So redlining prevented investments in infrastructure, green space, public transportation, business development, and all other aspects of city planning that make for a successful and prosperous and healthy neighborhood. Because banks refused to give loans to Black Americans decades ago, their descendants now deal with increased levels of air pollution and a lack of political will to competently and systemically address these issues. And when I say lack of political will, that is not on the part of the citizenry, that is on the part of the folks who have the power to turn the levers and they simply choose not to. Now, uh, this, this discussion of health disparities goes even further past just race, race and ethnicity. And I wanna focus also on classism and socioeconomic status as well. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this health equity issue. Lower income households in general, uh, dis, uh, dis, despite any uh, across all races, I should say, are at higher risk of being exposed to higher levels of gas stove pollution. And this is for a couple of reasons. First, low income folks tend to live in smaller unit sizes than high income folks. And it's important to remember what I said a couple slides ago that the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory found that in homes that were less than a thousand square feet, the level of NOx exceeded the outdoor standard 100% of the time when you use a gas stove without ventilation. Along with smaller unit sizes, there also are usually more people per home in low income households than in higher income households, which means that not only are more folks using the kitchen, more folks are breathing in the air pollutants and feeling these health effects as well. Next, low income families are also more likely to live in older homes and have less control over the maintenance of their appliances. Older homes may have gas stoves that haven't been properly adjusted in years, or may even still have a pilot light, um, or may even have inadequate ventilation over the stove. Now, the focus on the pilot light, I wanna drill that down a little bit because I know most gas stoves now use a sparker mechanism and don't have a pilot light, but in older homes that may have a pilot light, that means there is methane burning constantly in the home it's great and convenient when you want ramen noodles at 2 a.m., but that also means that these air pollutants that we've been talking about for the past 30 minutes are constantly being pumped into the home when there's a pilot light in the gas stove. Next, low-income homes are also more likely to use stoves and ovens for heat. Um, homes with inadequate ventilation, poor landlord management, and poor insulation make families in these situations turn to the most readily available source for heat for relief, which is typically their kitchen oven, which does heat the home and provide relief from the cold while also pumping NOx, CO, and particulate matter into the home as well while it's heating it. Next, low-income homes are also more likely to have higher exposure to outdoor air pollution for all the reasons that I said before on the previous slide. In particular, a lot of these big interstate highway uh, transportation infrastructure, especially in inner cities, or if we're thinking more rural, lower income homes also are typically next to fracking plants, industrial sites, power plants. Um, you know, rich folks won't, you know, will move away from those. And unfortunately, low income folks don't have the uh, ability to move away from that polluting infrastructure. And lastly, low income households are also more likely to already have a greater asthma burden, making them more sensitive to lower levels of these air pollutants than uh, folks who don't already have that greater asthma burden would. Now, I just threw a lot of depressing information at you, but before we get to the solutions to end on an upswing, because we never present a problem without a solution, I have another opportunity for some participant engagement and some audience participation here. So I have another question for y'all. Again, either unmute yourselves or throw your answer in the chat. Um, have you ever seen any of these health issues in your patients, in your friends, your family, your loved ones, in yourself? Um, have you ever experienced any of these uh, effects of fossil fuel pollution? Yes. Please, uh, do tell. 
uh, just just not feeling well when I'm uh, I didn't realize it until a long time. But when I'm around the stove doing a lot of cooking, not feeling well. Absolutely. It's something that I think most folks don't think about. You know, it's it's the stove. It's the kitchen. It's, you know, what you use to cook. But uh, when you take a moment to think, oh, wait a minute, it's fossil fuel that's being burned two feet away from my face. Of course, that might, you know, impact me in some way. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, again, it's, I think, something that folks don't really think about. And the Anyone whole else? Stove, the whole stove gets very hot, especially the back of it. And when the oven is on, you could almost heat the kitchen with what comes out of the oven, all the wasted heat. So right. waste, wasted fuel, wasted heat. Absolutely. We have an air filter in our home um, that we bought for when the wildfires are bad enough that the outdoor air quality is very poor. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed that if we turn on our stove or oven um, and don't use the hood or don't open the windows, then our, um, our indoor air, uh, air filter automatically kicks on. There you go. Some anecdotal evidence that, at least, you know, something is being pumped out of that gas stove, you know, and then coming into the air. Any other folks uh, want to share? Uh, yeah, Any I other have experience? a question. Please, I yeah. Have a que question. When you said some of the old stoves even have a pilot light, rather than the new striker thing, does that mean when you turn it on and it goes click, 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 then you don't have a pilot light? Correct. Yes. When okay. when you hear that snap, 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 that's the sparker trying to ignite the uh, ignite the methane. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. A good, a good way to check if you have a pilot light um, is to uh, take those big cast iron ranges off or off of the off of the stove and then lift it up. And if there's a there's a light, then if there's a flame, a small flame, then that that's your pilot light. Most stoves nowadays, I will say, have that sparker mechanism, particularly for for this issue for having an open flame in your kitchen at all points is uh, not great. To, uh, to round us out uh, with, with uh, experiencing some of these issues. Um, it's anecdotal to evidence, it's not scientific evidence, but there is um, a colleague at the San Francisco Bay chapter that shared during one of these trainings that uh, she lives in the Bay Area. And during the winter, she used to have a gas furnace and she would notice that her asthma and her wheezing symptoms would get incredibly bad during the winter because the home is being heated with natural gas. And a couple of years ago, her family transitioned to an electric heater as opposed to a uh, gas furnace, an electric furnace. And she noticed that, wow, I'm not wheezing and I'm not, you know, having trouble breathing in the winter when the heat's on, when the gas connection is no longer there. So again, it's anecdotal evidence, but it's just another experience of, you know, something about these gas stove pollutants is affecting our health in some way. So uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for sharing. And uh, let's now jump right into the meat and potatoes of this presentation, which is, of course, solutions. And before I tell you, you know, step by step what you can do uh, to address these health issues, I want to talk about solutions for a moment. To properly address this complex health issue, the solution should be multifaceted and systemic. First and foremost, the solution should address the target health effects of the patient that the patients are experiencing and should be within feasible and correct medical practice. Ideally, the solution should also incorporate and acknowledge the living environment of the patients and should aim to improve the quality of that environment. The intersection of these three core aspects is the most ideal, perfect situation. However, we all live in reality where nothing is ever ideal or perfect. So to that end, let's now take a look at what we can do to address some of these health issues. And just like any other health issue that we experience as health professionals, it starts with risk assessment and risk management. So first, we already did talk about some vulnerable populations already but I'm just gonna give you a laundry list of more folks that are at risk to either be higher exposed to gas stove pollutants or to feel these effects more than someone who's not in this population. So we already talked about children, but of course, uh, older folks and the elderly are also more uh, susceptible to feeling these health effects more. 
people living with diabetes, people of low socioeconomic status, folks living with obesity, and people with pre-existing heart and lung conditions are all at-risk populations for gas stove pollution or gas stove pollution health effects. Next, not just demographic wise, but some behavior and lifestyle risks that come with a uh, higher exposure could be uh, hobbies. When I say hobbies, I mean, do, do the, does the patient run in an area with high levels of outdoor air pollution? Are they around a lot of air pollution when they, you know, go play tennis when they're outside a lot? Uh, ventilation. Do, does the patient have access to ventilation? Is there an exhaust hood over their, uh, over their stove or do they practice ventilation like opening a window while using a gas stove? Next, smoking. Of course, smokers' lungs are already going to be degraded and are going to feel these effects of any kind of air pollutant more so than someone who does not smoke. Next, uh, the use of fossil fuels inside the home. Does the family even have a gas connection? Is there um, a natural gas connection in the home and do they use gas appliances, which would of course put them at higher risk of exposure to gas stove pollutants? Next, any time spent in heavy traffic or in-car behaviors, because as I said throughout this presentation, this transportation infrastructure uh, is also bad for our health because car exhaust is also, of course, bad for our respiratory health. So do they spend a lot of time in heavy traffic and what are their in-car behaviors? Do they roll down the windows? Do they use the AC? Do they smoke in the car? Um, and next, do they live near an industrial or a fracking site? Um, particularly, you know, thinking of a power plant, a wastewater treatment plant, a fracking extraction site, an oil extracting site, um, anything that's going to also produce a lot of outdoor air pollution. Those are some behavioral lifestyle risks that also put you at higher exposure or higher risks to feel these health effects more. So this is some risk assessment to think, okay, is this patient that I'm being presented with fall into any of these categories? Next, let's go into risk management. Now, uh, there's a couple ways to do risk management. First, I'm gonna talk about the patient level. You're in the room with the patient and, and you're talking about them and assessing them, uh, seeing what's wrong. First and foremost, address the health conditions. I don't think I need to tell y'all how to do your jobs. I'm sure y'all know how to treat a child with childhood asthma. If they don't have a rescue inhaler, get them a rescue inhaler, X, Y, and Z. Um, make sure that any of the immediate health effects that these folks are experiencing are properly managed with uh, any kind of uh, treatment that you see fit as a health professional. Next though, I do wanna talk about vague symptomology because a lot of the symptoms and feelings that I'm talking about here uh, are kind of vague, you know, headaches, fatigue, sinus congestion, cough, that could be anything. Um, and I'm not saying that every time a patient presents it's gonna be fossil fuel pollution because when it comes to air pollution, there are so many confounders. Um, when it comes to anything in our atmosphere that could be um, causing the patient to feel this way. But I just want to make sure that you keep in the back of your mind that these vague symptoms like fatigue, headache, sinus congestion, cough, can be caused by low levels of exposure to carbon monoxide and other volatile organic compounds that come from gas appliances. So uh, whether it could be allergies uh, or whether it could be gas stove pollution, just wanna make sure that you keep that in the back of your mind when we're looking at risk management. Now, when we're not in the room with a patient, when uh, you know, you're simply a health professional or a private citizen, what can we do? So let's talk about at the policy level, um, because this is where some widespread change is actually going to come when it comes to the use of fossil fuels inside the home. First and foremost, you can uh, join, or if you are already joined, urge your state medical specialty society or your uh, medical, uh, your state medical society or your medical specialty society to formally recognize the risk to health of eczematic children when cooking with gas. The societies you're a part of should work to raise awareness among doctors and nurses by developing and distributing guidance and intervention recommendations. And there's precedent for this if, if the Oregon State uh, Medical Society has not already recognized this. Um, the American Medical Association just passed a resolution a matter of days ago that formally recognized that yes, there is a connection between childhood asthma 
and gas appliance, specifically gas stove use in the home. So the American Medical Association has already said, yes, this is a thing and this is uh, a resolution that we are taking up and an issue we want to address. So there's precedent from uh, a nationwide uh, medical society. So uh, if you're really uh, fired up, this is something that maybe the Oregon Medical Society should uh, also take up or your medical specialty society. Because raising your voice is one of the most powerful acts um, that health professionals can do because we are trusted members of the community. You know, a lot of folks might not listen to the activist or the tree hugger, but they sure will listen to their doctor or their nurse. Um, so this is just to say raising your voice is one of the most important things you can do. And that leads me into my next risk management point, which would be getting a little bit more politically involved uh, in either your local county or state legislator. Now I left out federal here because I have little to no confidence that the change is going to come from the federal level. And I really do think it's going to come from grassroots movements of city councils, town halls, and state legislators to really try and get these health effects dealt with. Um, you can contact your local county or state legislators and ask them if there are any current electrification bills or policies that are on the table for this current legislative season, or there are probably um, news articles or publishings about things that are about to come on the table for your local legislator. Supporting these legislative electrification efforts, and when I say electrification, I mean electric appliances as opposed to gas appliances, um, Supporting these efforts as health professionals will add the really needed weight to the movement and hopefully start to push some of these electrification policies through. Just as, as an example of um, how uh, energy and health and political involvement are, are, are connected, um, is an example of public utility commissions, PUCs, uh, if you will. Public utility commissions, there's about three to five uh, public utility commissioners per state. So it's about 200 in the entire nation. These public utility commissions decide where the state will buy their energy from. So the Massachusetts PUC will decide we're going to buy from, you know, this natural gas plant, this solar plant, and this oil plant, and that's the combination of energy we're going to have for the state's energy needs. Um, now, an example of how uh, an enraged and politically involved citizenry can turn the tide for a PUC would be Nevada. In 2015, the Nevada Public Utility Commission outlawed, outlawed banned the use of solar energy in the state of Nevada. The state of Nevada will not buy solar energy for their energy needs. Nevada is one of the hottest and one of the sunniest states in the nation. That doesn't make sense. Um, so the citizenry caught on to that, protested, raised their voice, and eventually the PUC did flip their decision, and now Nevada is one of the largest solar energy producers in the nation. So convincing 200 folks to make the electric transition and have some green policies is a hell of a lot easier than trying to convince 330 million people to go vegan, to decrease their carbon footprint, you know, and to also be healthier. So in terms of health and energy, a public utility commission could be a wonderful way for health professionals to really add weight to the uh, green and electrification movement. Now, I will say as a caveat, PUCs are notoriously corrupt and they are tend to be a revolving door of oh, I just left a fossil fuel company, let me work for a PUC. Oh, I just left the PUC, let me go work for a fossil fuel company. So I'm not gonna say it's not a roadblock or a hurdle to jump over, but certainly it is a avenue for health professionals to get politically involved and try to manage on a wide scale some of these health effects that we're seeing from uh, gas stove pollution. Now, as just an individual yourselves or what to tell your patient to do in the kitchen to reduce their exposure, Let's go to that right now. So here are some individual actions we can take in the kitchen to reduce our risk of exposure to gas stove pollution. I'll go through each of these real quick. Install and maintain a carbon monoxide detector. Most homes probably already do have a carbon monoxide detector, but I've recently learned that most carbon monoxide detectors will only go off when the level is fatal. When the level is, please leave the room, get out of your home, it's incredibly fatally dangerous. What we're looking for is a carbon monoxide detector that will go off at lower levels um, that would uh, say, hey, by the way, there's some low level carbon monoxide, turn on your fan, open your window, get some sort of airflow going to reduce your risk of exposure. 
uh, to that point, if it's available, run your exhaust hood when you're cooking uh, with your gas stove. I know they're loud. I know they might not always uh, work all the time. For example, uh, I rent here in New York City. I have a gas stove and my exhaust hood is simply the microwave fan that is installed above my gas stove. So that has no outdoor ventilation connection, but it certainly does uh, get the air pollution away from my face into the rest of the kitchen and closer to my kitchen window to get some airflow going. Next, this is one of my favorite ones because it's free 99. You can open a window while you're cooking. Now I say it's my favorite, probably a little bias here as a lifelong New Yorker because I do not deal with wired fires like all of y'all do over in Oregon. So as a caveat, I completely understand that if it's wildfire season and the outdoor air quality is certainly not great, you might not want to open your window. So uh, to that end, uh, then we would turn on the exhaust hood or try some of the other ones on the right hand side. But let me just quick say um, to finish off on the left over here, cooking on the back burners. Now, this is something that wasn't really intuitive to me when I started this work, but I've learned that when we cook on the front burners, the air pollution is much more likely to spill out into the, uh, our kitchen as opposed to being caught by uh, any kind of exhaust hood that we have. If we cook on the back burners, that air pollution is much more likely to be caught by exhaust hoods and vented outside if the exhaust hood does have an outdoor connection. Now, if it's wildfire season and you can't open your window, um, if it's you know 10 degrees outside and snowing in Minnesota, if it's 106 in Arizona and you don't want to open your window and keep the AC on, I completely understand that. So let's go over here to the right hand side for some uh, mitigation strategies uh, to simply reduce the amount of time that we are turning on that gas stove burner. You can use electric appliances like toaster ovens, kettles, air fryers, any kind of plug in plug out countertop appliance that does some cooking for you that reduces the amount that you're using that gas stove. Now. If you're looking for that pan fry function, uh, because of course, you know, a toaster oven and an air fryer and a kettle can't solve all cooking functions. If you're really looking for that pan fry function, um, I would say try a plug in, plug out countertop induction burner. Now, again, I'm not trying to sell you anything, I promise. Um, but I've done some research on some online retailers. A single unit induction burner is about 60 bucks. Um, double burners are about, uh, 110, 120. Uh, I know it's a pretty penny, uh, but if you were looking to reduce our gas stove use and some of these other strategies aren't available, um, trying that plug in, plug out induction burner may be a good way to uh, reduce the amount that you're turning on your gas stove. But if we're really trying to get at the root cause of the pollution, it's ripping out the gas stove and replacing it with an electric induction option. Um, I know that probably is not high up on everyone's financial priority list right now, uh, but if you have the ability to replacing that gas stove with an electric induction option is going to dramatically reduce the amount of gas stove pollution that you are exposed to because you're reducing the amount of fossil fuels being burned in your home. Now, I do just want to spotlight the induction stove a little bit because I know we may have horror stories in our minds about electric cooking, those resistance coils, they smell bad, they took 84 years to boil water. Electric stoves really weren't great. However, there have been some lovely strides in the past couple of years with electric cooking, particularly with the invention and mass production of induction. So let me go through why induction stoves are so great real quick. First of all, they're electric which means that there is no indoor fossil fuel pollution in your home. Now, caveat, I do recognize that the majority of electricity in the United States is generated by the combustion of fossil fuels. So there is fossil fuel pollution next to the power plant. However, the fossil fuel pollution that you're experiencing in your home is decreased to almost zero in the kitchen, at least, because there is no fossil fuel being burned when you use this when you use this kind of stove next it lowers household accident risk because of how induction stoves work so how induction works is that there is a wire coil beneath this little glass top an electric current is put through that wire that electric current generates a magnetic field 
And the resistance to that magnetic field, when you put a, a, a pot or a pan on this induction stove, the particles in the pot or the pan resist that magnetic field. And that is what makes the pot or the pan get hot, not direct conduction from an open flame heating up a material. So only the pot or the pan is going to get hot, not your entire stovetop, like we just heard before, how the entire appliance when you use a gas stove gets screaming hot when you turn that oven or that uh, stovetop on. So if you have a little one who's touching and grabbing and reaching, and all of a sudden they reach up and touch the stove while you're cooking, their hand won't get burned. Don't let them touch the pot or the pan. That's going to be hot. But the entire appliance itself is not going to be screaming hot. Next, it's an investment in your family's health. Um, I know that this, again, just like I said, replacing an entire kitchen appliance is probably not high up on everyone's financial priority list. No, it's been a rough couple of years and it's certainly a rough time right now. Um, but if uh, replacing the entire appliance is not uh, available, is not a financial reality, getting one of those plug in, plug out single or double unit uh, induction burners could be a cheaper option uh, and reduce the amount of uh, gas that you are burning in your home. Uh, if, you have a heart, if you have a child or someone in your home is having a hard time breathing, increasing induction cooktop use and decreasing gas stove use can provide some relief while larger scale, longer term systemic work is done to decrease the amount of air pollution in your neighborhood or some regulations about getting gas connections in residential uh, developments and commercial developments out of here. So that is my little pitch to you to uh, try induction cooking. And before we wrap up real quick and get to the Q&A portion, I do just want to uh, tease a little bit of a solution, of a little bit of a topic that is being touted by the gas industry as a solution that is certainly not. And that's hydrogen blending. This is another wonderful opportunity for health professionals to raise their voice because not only is hydrogen blending bad for the planet, it's also bad for our health. So essentially what is happening is the gas industry is proposing that they blend hydrogen gas into the methane gas supply to lower the amount of methane gas that they use. However, that is bad for the planet because to get hydrogen in a form that we can use takes an incredible amount of energy that is going to require an incredible amount of fossil fuels to be burned. Next, um, when you burn the combination of hydrogen and methane, you produce more NO2 than if you were to just combust methane alone. So this hydrogen blending soup is more dangerous for our respiratory health and it's also more dangerous for the planet because, for example, hydrogen has its uses for sectors that are incredibly hard to decarbonize, long-range cargo shipping, long-range trucking. That is what hydrogen should be reserved for, not blending it in the system to burn in our homes. So if uh, you are interested in this, a PSR just released a recent report um, detailing all of the nitty gritty details. I just dropped that right into the chat. If you would like to uh, read that and learn more about hydrogen blending. Uh, to wrap us up real quick in the last couple minutes, uh, I do, uh, I have another favor and ask for you all if you could complete this short post test. It is the same questions y'all answered in the pre test, as long as some, uh, as well as some demographic feedback data. How'd we do? How'd you like this training? What could we do in the future to improve upon it? Um, you know, data, 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 and feedback is uh, the name of the game. So if you could take uh, a moment to fill it out, that would be great. Um, if you could click on it and open it up in a tab, doesn't have to be right now because I do wanna save the last five minutes for us to uh, speak about uh, some questions and have a Q&A. So won't speak about this right now. It's just showing all of the wonderful things PSR has done in the building electrification sector. I'll send you all these slides if you would like to read them afterwards. Um, if you would like to, I mean, all of you are probably already PSR members, but if you would like to uh, join PSR National's Climate Ambassador Program, 
you'll get to uh, work hand in hand with PSR national staff on issues specifically about climate change, renewable energy, and environmental justice. I just dropped that link in the chat. You'll also get an email with all of these links as well. And with that, uh, if you are looking for CME or CEU credit, uh, another link that I'm about to drop right in the chat for you all. Uh, this will take you to the portal where you can access those credits or you can scan the QR code on the screen right now. And with that, I am done dropping links in the chat. I am done talking at you. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, uh, listening to me for the past, you know, 50 minutes to an hour. And I would love to answer any of y'all's questions that you have. Already. Oh, actually, you know what? Someone dropped a question in the chat before, didn't they, about PUCs? Are PUC commissioners an appointed position or elected? I do believe that they are an appointed position. I don't think we elect our public utility commissioners, um, which is, I guess, how the corruption happens so easily because, you know, friends of friends uh, and in the energy sector tend to just, it's a revolving door of fossil fuel execs. Um, but yes, I do believe that PUCs are an appointed position instead of an elected position. Hello, yes, Alona. Hi, in Clark County here in Vancouver, Washington, our utility commissioners are elected and my husband is running. Wonderful, <laughs> incredible. Well, one, good for him. Does he have a, does he have a, you wanna promo him? Does he have a website or something that uh, we can drop in the chat real quick? Um, it is Steinke, S-T-E-I-N-K-E, -E, the number four, Clark, P-U-D, dot com. Great. Uh, whoops, sorry. I just sent that as a private message. Let me put that to everyone. There we go. So uh, thank you so much for sharing, Alona, and best of luck to to your husband. I really uh, earnestly hope that uh, he wins this election. That's great. Well, well, thank you so much. And we have been successful in getting the city of Vancouver to come up with a magnificent climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we're also lobby the uh, building code commission uh, council to outlaw gas in new buildings. In, incredible. That's, and that's the kind of large scale policy change that we're looking for, because it's all well and good if I yell and scream that you need to rip your gas stove out and replace it with a five grand expensive induction stove. But if a policy comes through with city code and saying, actually, we're just not even gonna build gas connections in new construction, there's not even an option to have a gas stove. So right. that's wonderful, Alona. And a shout out to induction ranges. Our electric range died, bought the induction and talk about instant heat um, as awesome. It's really Thank good. And, and I know someone had said uh, adjustable cooking and getting really uh, accurate cooking with gas stoves. You can set the specific degree that you want that water to be boiling at when you have an induction stove. So yep. you can get really, really accurate. Um, and there's even a movement among the cooking and chef uh, chef sector right now. Uh, there's a lot of chefs that are really pushing to get induction cooking into large scale commercial kitchens, as well as uh, residential kitchens as well. Right. Do, uh, does anyone else have uh, any other comments, questions, concerns? I see a, a question in the chat. Any info about strong uh, electromagnetic fields on the human body? Sure. So actually, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, thank Karen. Thank you sir, for bringing this up um, because there is there is um, a caveat when it comes to induction stoves, where because of that magnetic field, um, there's a little there's a little bit of like a uh, safety warning for folks with um, pacemakers and any kind of um, electric medical device that is implanted inside of your body. Um, the magnetic field may and can have an effect on the function of those uh, mechanics. However, you need to be incredibly close, essentially like on the burner or just over it for uh, those to have a serious effect. 
So uh, yes, there are some effects that in that uh, magnetic fields can have on um, any kind of impl implanted electric medical device, um, but you need to be incredibly close to the magnetic field for uh, you to feel that. Alrighty, folks, any other uh, comments, questions, concerns? Oh, how do I raise my hand? Raise hand, okay. Yes, hi, Theodora. Hi, um, I, I heard someplace that um, nitrogen dioxide is heavier than air, thus would sink to the floor and cause higher risk to infants and toddlers that may be on the floor and that I also heard that opening a window really doesn't do much. And if we keep telling people to ventilate, they may be mistaking, thinking that they're protected. And that really concerns me. Um, and most of the, the um, fans on gas stoves are, what do you call it? The, yeah, anyway, they're loud. Mm -hmm. People don't turn them on. When I turn mine on, I can't hear anything else. And if you're worrying about a child, you may not want to turn on that loud thing because you have to listen to see if your kid is okay. So there's a lot of concerns with just saying to people, plus the gas industry seems to blame people and say they didn't, they didn't ventilate and they didn't turn on their fan, so. Right, and and I do have to agree with you that um, absolutely not everyone has access to uh, the exhaust hood, and when the exhaust hood is used, it is kind of loud and annoying. Um, the the main reason why I say ventilate, ventilate, ventilate is because it tends to be the most readily available and easiest option to increase airflow in the kitchen and at least kind of distribute the pollutants uh, in a wider way than just sitting in a soup in your kitchen. Now, I have to agree with you that ventilation is not perfect. Opening the window is not perfect. And the, the end goal would be to not turn on that gas range and use an electric uh, appliance, whether it's, you know, if you put a big butcher block on your gas range and just use that as extra counter space, and then use plug in plug out appliances uh, for your cooking functions or to replace it entirely with an induction stove. That is kind of the root cause solution when we're thinking about gas stove pollution. Um, but to address uh, some concerns about um, NO2 being heavier, uh, I, I have to admit, I, I cannot tell you whether or not uh, that NO2 is heavier than air in general, but uh, in particularly when we're thinking about other fuel sources like propane, Propane uh, is absolutely heavier than air and at higher risk for pets or little ones that are still crawling. Um, and uh, NO2 in general, uh, the, the, National the Berkeley National Laboratory study folks measured it um, not close to the ground, but they did have a device that measured it, I guess, maybe like chest level or head level. Um, so they were uh, measuring it in general in the kitchen. Thank you so much, Anne, for confirming that yes, NO2 is heavier than air. Um, so the folks were measuring it, uh, not at ground level, but at, uh, chest or, or head level. Um, so I guess that means that yes, even though, uh, it is sinking, uh, the pollution is coming out and at least being measured around where we would be breathing. Um, and again, uh, opening the window isn't perfect by any means. Um, but for someone who may not have, uh, an option to, uh, decrease their use of the gas stove, anything to get that airflow going uh, is great. But I have to agree with you, this is not a personal responsibility lecture. This is a let's keep the dinosaur juice in the ground and stop using fossil fuels in general uh, General uh, solution. So thank you, Theodora. Uh, Michael. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It was well put together. I really appreciated the focus on uh, low income folks who are at greatest risk and minorities who are at greatest risk and particularly the solutions part of it. But I'm hoping that sometime in the future we can see some presentation about encouraging people to get on board with measures to um, prohibit new gas or gas in new construction. 
uh, that's going to take that's obviously for wealthier folks, um, but it may also be for low income housing in the future as well. If we can keep gas out of there in the first place, uh, we're way ahead of the game. Uh, so anyway, that's the one addition that I would want to suggest and, and have that be potentially another campaign that we could get behind. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up, Michael. I wholeheartedly agree with you because, again, it's not going to come from individual actions. It's going to come from city zoning policies changing uh, and preventing gas connections in new construction. Um, as an example of what PSR has already done, Washington PSR has done some wonderful, wonderful work with uh, statewide with Governor Inslee, starting with three cities, Shoreline, Tacoma, and Seattle. They really pushed exactly what you're saying, getting people on board with preventing new gas connections. And those three cities uh, said, we will not have new gas connections in new commercial building and no gas connections in high density residential uh, construction. What uh, they're trying to do now is trying to get to low density residential construction, because of course that's what the majority of Americans living in suburbia tend to live in. Um, and Governor Inslee uh, seems to be on board with that as well. So uh, there is some movement, of course, and absolutely I'll talk to our policy coordinator, Jake, to, to get that campaign going. Absolutely. Great. Thank you Any very other? much. You're very welcome.